are going to also be broadcasting to Facebook. So let me just make sure our Facebook link is up and running. Oh dear. I'm just putting us on Facebook. The pressure is on. <laughs> so if anyone who's watching has their video on and doesn't want it on Facebook, just turn your video off. Okay, let's see here. Okay, it looks like our concert is live. Hooray! Technology is working. I think it's all on our side. So let's go like this. We did it. We're live on Facebook. And now it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this amazing celebration. So I have a few announcements before we start our storytelling. First of all, I would like to give a big thank you to the Storytelling Association of California, otherwise known as SAC, for the idea of putting together this, pro this program where the North and the South meet each other here in California. SAC is an organization that promotes storytelling as a living art, and we are all here this afternoon to participate in this amazing living art. I'd also like to please thank BZ Smith from the Motherlode Storytelling Guild for working with me today on putting together this program. A big thank you to Tim McCaffrey, who is going to be sharing a story and a song later this afternoon in our program for putting together our amazing postcard. Now, in lieu of an admission ticket, this concert is being brought to you free, but we are requesting that you if possible, make a donation to the National Storytelling Network in support of Storytelling Association of California. I'm going to be putting a link in the chat if you would like to make a donation because the National Storytelling Association is the mother of all of us in terms of storytelling in the United States. And now we have gone global and we are an international storytelling association. So I will be talking about that a little bit more later on. So the whole idea of celebration was started by a storyteller whose name was J.G. Pinkerton. And he dreamed of this idea in 1988. He said, I have a dream of having a night each year when storytellers in each community can get together and tell stories to their family and friends. He decided to call this celebration a tell abration And friends of storytelling liked the idea, and so celebration was started in 1988. Each year, the circle of friends for celebration has grown, and now celebration happens all across America as well as all across the world. J.G. Pinkerton said, through storytelling, we can draw closer together in peace, in friendship, and in love. Storytelling reaches around the world and across the generations, reminding us of our common humanity. And I know that storytelling creates experiences and shared experiences are the basis of all relationships. If he were here today, he would say, my best wishes go with all who join in this common endeavor. So this evening, we think about J.G. Pinkerton and his amazing dream of bringing the world together through storytelling. And so now it is my pleasure to pronounce this celebration proclamation on behalf of NSN. 
in the name of storytelling, the National Storytelling Network and the Mother Load Storytelling Guild and Community Storytellers, we are proud to sponsor Telebration, the worldwide event of storytelling at this very moment across six continents in 40 states and nine countries from Sacramento to Savannah, from Boise to Barcelona, from the West Virginia to the West Indies, from Los Angeles to Lithuania, over 300 audiences are gathered right now for this spectacular storytelling event. So without further delay, enjoy and anticipation, let the stories begin. <laughs> Our first storyteller this afternoon will be Cynthia Restivo, and she's going to be telling a story about baking. I know I've been doing a lot of baking ever since COVID hit, and she has been telling stories and listening to stories for over 25 years because she says there's nothing better than that. I asked all of our storytellers for our concert today to tell me one thing they're grateful for. And she said she is grateful to all the storytellers who have walked the path before us. So without further delay, I'd like to bring up Cynthia. And now I just have to find her. Here we go, Cynthia Restivo. It's all yours. All right, well, I am delighted to get this party started. I would like to, um, tell you a story about uh, that takes place back in the mid 1980s, back when my children were, um, I mean, back when I was younger than my daughters are today. In that time, I was at a, um, let me get rid of this. Um, at that time, I was uh, got a job at the International Theater that was based in Vienna, Austria. It was a theater company that was an English-speaking theater company, and we traveled around Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. And we, I moved into a flat with five other actors. Now, you know how when an ensemble gets assembled, there is... Um, you know, we all come with our suitcases full of challenges and gifts. And fortunately for me, Frederick Graff was one of the people that were there. He came from New Jersey and he could have been a chef if he had not heard the theater's call. We traveled a lot in that year and a half throughout Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and we would go, we ate out a lot as well. And when a restaurant owner found out that we were touring artists, well, there would be an appetizer that showed up on our table or a round of drinks or on the house, a restaurant owner would announce and our entire bill would be taken care of. I know. Europeans know how to treat their artists. America could learn something from Europeans, I say. And you know, the great thing about Frederick Graff, most of us, when we were eating at these restaurants, we were eating there just to fill our bellies. But Frederick, he would take a bite and, mm, that food would linger in his mouth just a moment longer than the rest of ours. And then when we got back to Vienna, he would remake that entree or that appetizer. Uh, he had an uncanny ability to taste and recreate. <laughs> so we ate good. We could even say, hey, Frederick, try this. And he'd come over and Can you make it? And he just smiled. So, you know how it is when you're around someone that's a creative genius? You hope just a little bit 
of their talent might rub off on you. <laughs> so one night, all the actors were at the theater. I wasn't in that scene. So I was at the kitchen table and I was studying my lines and I got an idea. The day before I had been down at the corner bakery and I had had a coffee flavored cake and it just, mm, when it was in my mouth, mm, I thought, this is good cake. So I went to the cupboards and I opened those doors with the same optimism that theater curtains open every night. And I started selecting the ingredients that would be just right. And I mixed them together. Now I didn't use a recipe. I wasn't a paint by number kind of gal. I was an artist. And so I was mixing and I, mm, mm, maybe a little bit more of this and, oh yeah, that's perfect. And so I poured that creamy batter into a well greased and floured pan. I walked over to the oven and, oh my gosh, the oven, well, the dial did not go from a hundred to 500 degrees. You do remember we were in Europe. I had been there four months and I had never noticed that the numbers went from 50 to 250. And I thought, oh my gosh. Well, I, I know it's not what I, I know. Uh, um, well, it can't be 250. I, I was gonna bake it at 350, but um, well, 250 is the highest it goes. So maybe, I, well, if 250 is the highest and 50 is the, well, maybe just right around, may, maybe just right here, 175. And that's where I set the dial and I waited for it to heat up. And then I said, well, I'm gonna have to watch this cake because you know, I'm not positive where I sent the dial. And so I opened up the oven and I set the cake pan into the oven and closed it and waited and got back to my uh, studying of the lines. And, but you know, it wasn't long, it was not long before the whole room smelled like a coffee flavored cake. Ooh, weren't my flatmates gonna be surprised? They knew that I grew up in a household where my mom opened a can, poured it into a pot, stirred, stirred and served our nightly dinners. And so here I was, bacon without a recipe. <laughs> and um, so I peeked and I, Oh yeah, it needed a little bit more time. I took out a, 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 a toothpick and I waited a little bit longer. I thought maybe I should get out the plates so that I could serve it up for when they came home from rehearsal. And, and I, I opened the uh, oven again and I checked, oh no, just a little bit more time. I got out the forks and I, I waited. <laughs> this was gonna be great. I checked again. Oh, it, I'm sure, oh yes, it was ready. Oh, it was ready. I took it out and I set it out on top of the stove and waited just a few minutes so it could cool down a little bit. I know something about bacon. I mean, you know, I knew something. And uh, then I took the round pan and I, I turned it over the serving plate and 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 I and I hit the bottom of the pan and and that cake it fell out easily with a clunk a clunk cakes are not supposed to clunk and, and the, the 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 height of that cake did not rise from the three quarters of an inch, it, well, okay, we were in Vienna, the 19 millimeters that it was, did not raise one millimeter. I thought it kind of strange, but you know, what, what do I know? <laughs> so then I, just then as it was laying on that plate, I heard mm, the rattling of the doorknob and the door swung open and five actors came in full of sound and fury and notes of their rehearsal. And 
the smell, it greeted them at the door. And you know how it is when someone's been baking up a storm and that, that smell just wraps around you. And they all slid into their chairs and said, all right, dish it up. And I cut each piece of that cake and I put it on their plates and they took their fork and they took a bite. And uh, I looked at their faces and their faces were telling me like, are you joking? So, so I took a little nibble and it was hard. I mean, it was hard. And, and I, I said, it's all right. You, you, you don't have to eat it. But they were adults. Frederick said it was interesting. I'm no child. I know what interesting means. I said, really, you don't have to. But they were adults. They cleaned their plates into the garbage. Then Frederick grabbed hold of the remaining part of the cake. It was almost in the shape of a football. He called out, I'm going to pass it to you. And he threw that football. John jumped up, grabbed it, and threw it over to David, who threw it to Delbert. And that cake was flying through the air. And I said, whoa, someone's going to get hurt. Frederick said, with a piece of cake? Then I said, Frederick, what I do wrong? He said, baking powder. Baking soda? <laughs> oh, baking powder. It makes the cake rise. Oh. Oh. Well, you know, this Thanksgiving, it's going to be a little different for a lot of us. There isn't going to be Aunt Thelma there making the stuffing or Uncle Charlie making the pumpkin cheesecake. So when you get ready for your Thanksgiving dinner and you put in that stove what you think is a coffee flavored cake, don't be surprised if what comes out is your night's entertainment. Thank you, Cynthia. I'd love to taste that cake. Sounds yummy to me, especially the clunk part. <laughs> so if you would like to share a recipe that you have perfected during this lockdown time, maybe you can write it in the chat. I'd like to just see a show of hands. How many of you have been doing a lot more baking these days? I need to go to gallery view so I can see everyone. Baking, a lot more baking, yeah. How about cakes, cookies, bread? How many of you have learned to make baked pears? Well, I have been perfecting the art of baked pears. And I would like to bring up our next storyteller who is going to be sharing a story from China called The Pear Tree. Nick Smith is a longtime teller of historical tales and folk tales, and sometimes both in the same story. And I am grateful to have known Nick for almost 30 years. So let me find Nick here in this sea of faces. Please help me welcome Nick Smith. Now I thought of telling this story because I first learned it during one of the flu epidemics when I was a child. You see, when I was a child, I had the flu really, really badly and had to stay out of school for two or three weeks. I was the second most sick kid in the class, but the only thing that my parents found to keep me entertained was to let me read whatever I wanted. And sometime during that illness, they bought me a collection of Asian folk tales. 
And this is one of the stories that I learned from that book. And so it reminds me of getting through times of people being sick. It also reminds me of other things that you'll probably learn in the story if you're not familiar with it. You see, one day near a town in China, there was a farmer coming to town for the market day, and he had a wagon load of pears. He had been growing pears for years, but this, this was his finest crop ever. He was so proud that he had finally grown the pears that people would dream of, that the taste in your mouth would make you think of faraway places and faraway things. More importantly, though, they were pears that people would pay a lot of money for because they were absolutely wonderful quality. And as he was getting ready to get the last way into town to sell his merchandise, to sell his wagon load of wonderful pears, a wanderer passed by and he looked at the wagon load of pears and he looked at the farmer and he said, excuse me, sir, but could you spare one of those? I haven't eaten a pear that looks that good in a long, long time, and I don't have any money to buy one from you, and I know you're not set up to sell them yet, but if you could just give me one, that would be so great of you. And the farmer said, give you one of these pears when I'm not even ready to sell them yet? Bah, be off with you. And the wanderer started to turn away sadly, but a nearby person also heading into the town market said, wait, wait, please sell one to me. And the farmer said, oh, all right, I'll sell you one. And the, the passerby bought the pear from the farmer and turned it and gave it to the ragged wanderer. Now the wanderer said, that was so generous of you. I am going to show you something. I'm going to come up with pears for everyone waiting to go into the marketplace. And the farmer said, if you could do that, why didn't you have your own pears? And the wanderer said, because I needed this. And he cut open the farmer's pear and pulled out a seed and planted it in the ground next to the road. And as the people stared in astonishment, that seed turned into a sprout. And that sprout grew up out of the ground and turned into a small but very pretty full-grown pear tree in a matter of moments. And the wanderer said, ah, now it's ready. And he took a bite out of the farmer's pear that he'd still been holding, but then he pulled off one of the freshly ripened pears on his own tree and handed it to the man who had been generous to him. And the man cut it open and took a bite and said, this is delicious. And others came up and said, could you give us one also? And everyone was watching the wanderer and his little pear tree. And as each person came up, he gave them a pear from his own tree. Well, the farmer was astonished by all of this and watching this man who had created pears out of nothing and was giving them away. And as the last of the pears from the pear tree had been given away, the wanderer took out a little hatchet out of his pack and cut away the base of the small pear tree and cut the branches off of it and turned it into a walking stick and turned and began to walk away. Well, everyone thought the entertainment was over, so they prepared to go on into the marketplace, and the farmer turned back to his wagon, and the pears, his wagon load of pears, his wagon load of perfect, wonderful pears, his wagon was empty. And worse, the little wagon pulling rod at the front was gone. 
And when he turned to look at the wanderer walking off into the distance, that staff that he was carrying looked a lot like what should be at the front of his own wagon. Well, he began to yell and jump up and down, but the wanderer simply vanished into the crowd and was not seen again that day. So not only had the farmer lost his pears, but he had to pay someone to fix his wagon before he could go home. Did he learn a lesson that day about kindness? Perhaps. Did he learn a lesson that day about generosity? Perhaps. Did he learn a lesson about how he had turned a great profit into a small loss? Definitely. And that is the story of the pear tree. Thank you, Nick, for that story. So the next time I make my special pears, I'll see if there's some way I can get you some. <laughs> my pear perfected COVID recipe. So I'd like to bring up our next storyteller. It's perfect that I'm bringing up a storyteller who is actually a tree doctor. Peter Severanen is an arborist. And when he is not telling story, he is the doctor of the trees. And he shares his love of all things from the natural world when he tells his stories. I asked him what he is thankful for this Thanksgiving and he said, he is grateful that nature keeps embracing us with no hard feelings for past trespasses. And so now I would like to bring up Peter Severanen. I grew up during World War II at the edge of a small village in the Netherlands. There was no TV, internet, or supermarket, but we created our own entertainment. Our house was full of books and we had fresh vegetables and fruit from the garden. The war was mainly distant. We never received a direct hit from a German bomb. Life was exciting. We were homeschooled, but on days that there was no school, I could choose whether to go to the vast village-like psychiatric institute across the street where my father was the medical director, or I could choose to read, or I could go to the big forest. The forest was close to our backyard. It had lots of wild animals, deer, foxes, badgers, there was also some unexploded ordnance, and every once in a while, a village kid would step on one of those and become a statistic. But being in that forest was just heaven. It was everything I wanted. Nature was my lifeline. Now, my parents had a somewhat hands-off attitude towards education. And they did not ask where I had spent the day and I did not tell them. Whenever I could, I would go to the forest and I could spend all day there walking around. If I was very ambitious, and was willing to walk for hours, I could make it to the heat fields. After hours of walking, I would come to a section where there were acres and acres of purple, purple flowering heather, the heath or heather fields. And interspersed in there was, was an occasional peat 
bog. And one of them was my favorite. And going there in that landscape where you weren't quite sure what was going on. There were all the fantastic things. There was that inviting water. There were the black reflecting water. There was the, the insects flying around. And there was also the added attraction of mortal danger. I knew that if I came too close to that pond, some of the plants would give way. They wouldn't hold my weight and I would sink down. And I knew if that happened or if I just happened to slip and fall in the water, I might not be able to crawl out because inviting as that bog pond looked. It had lots of underwater vegetation and there was a thick layer of sphagnum moss at the bottom. And if I fell in, I might not be able to get out. And I knew that because in a local museum, I had seen the remains of a Roman soldier, at least his uniform and his weapons. Because 2000 years ago, that soldier had slipped in the pond and he had been in that underwater pickling bath for 1500 years in that anaerobic milieu. And he came out remarkably well preserved, but I knew that those things could happen. And when I was walking around that pond, carefully treading my way, I would see an occasional methane gas bubble rise to the surface. And occasionally it would just explode. And if I was really lucky, that gas bubble would, as soon as it hit the surface, self-ignite and explode with a crash and a flash. Those were heavenly days for a little boy. Sadly enough, now almost all of that magic landscape is gone. A rising population needed more homes and more farms and the bog ponds and the heather fields were developed, which means that they were just covered with soil. But that does not mean that they stopped acting up because global warming this year made for a very hot and dry summer. And all that underground, now underground peat moss still and the heat started shrinking and settling down and everything on top, the soil, the roads, the homes, the bridges, they also started settling, but they did so unevenly. And now thousands of homes need new foundations inserted to the tune of up to $100,000 each. And I look at that and I think this is what global warming does, the price it extracts in a very small instance, a very little example of what global warming does when we don't take care of our self-inflicted wounds. If you want to know more about the effects of global warming and what we can do. You might want to take a look at the Paul Hawken book, Countdown. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Perhaps you could write in the chat the name of the book 
that okay. you suggested that would really be awesome. How fortunate for you that you were able to experience those bogs in your childhood. Um, I also went to an exhibit years ago at the California Science Center that was about the people that got trapped in the bogs and how they found bones in the bogs. And I had never even heard of those bogs before. So um, I envy you having that in your childhood. It's yeah. perfect that our next storyteller will be sharing a story after Peter because she's probably the biggest activist I know of on the subject of global warming. And she also happens to be a very dear friend of mine. I met Vicki around 30 years ago at Community Storytellers. Matter of fact, I met many of our tellers this evening, many years ago at Community Storytellers. Vicki says she's been crafting and telling personal stories ever since she attended her first Community Storytellers meeting, which was in 1989. And that's actually the year that I started going when I moved to California. She said that she was inspired by the personal stories that I shared and Penny Post, who is here at our concert listening this afternoon. And when I asked her what she's thankful for, she said she's thankful for Zoom since she's afraid to leave her house. So here's Vicki telling a story called The End of the Line. Please help me welcome Vicki Yudis. I wake up. I look at my phone. It's 3 a.m. My throat hurts. Do I have COVID? Am I breathing? Okay, I'm breathing. And my throat probably hurts just because I snore. In fact, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to go to a sleep center and be tested for sleep apnea. Because if you snore really loud every day, you could have sleep apnea and die. Do I smell smoke? I smelled smoke earlier outside from the bobcat fire 15 miles away. I go to the kitchen to boil water to soothe my throat. The smell of smoke is stronger now. I go to the laptop on the kitchen counter and I Google fires near me. And there's the bobcat, nothing else, but a new fire could have broken out nearby. A fire not yet reported. Should I call someone? Who? I think I hear flames outside. I mean that crackling sound. I go to the window, I look out, I can't see anything. Oh, maybe because the air is so thick with smoke, that crackling sound is louder now. I'm just gonna go, okay? I'm just gonna pack the go bag and go. I yank my kid's figure drawing studies off the walls of the living room. She's gonna want those. Okay, I want those. And, and from the bookcase, I'm gonna take the bobblehead of Sheldon, that character from the Big Bang Theory. My kid and I watched every episode years ago. The photograph of the two of us in our pink pussy hats at the DC Women's March, the DVD of me in a red wig selling Budding's lunch meat on television years ago. I want that. And food, you know, I need to take food. So uh, cans, cans of beans and corn, stuff I can eat with a spoon. I'll need a spoon and a can opener. Pants, I need pants, I can't just wear this t-shirt, I will need pants and shoes. So I go to the closet in my bedroom and I put on pants and shoes. And then I go back to the kitchen and I pack up my laptop and my purse and my keys and my, my kitty, my 17 year old kitty. She sleeps in her bed, she's deaf. I have to take her and her carrier and her food and the enormous blind goldfish and the two fire belly newts, my kids pets from when she was small whom I have taken care of all these years. I will put the fish in one bucket and the newts in another and I will have to drive very slowly so the water doesn't slosh out of the buckets. Will an evacuation center take me with a cat and two buckets? Is all this stuff gonna fit in the car? You know, I could put the seat down. I could tie something to the roof. I could hold something on my lap. I could, I... no. How many people live in Los Angeles? Four million. <laughs> There's no way. There's no way we can evacuate because I mean, we would never make it. We would kill each other trying to get out. We would all just burn to death sitting in our cars, bumper to bumper on the freeway. There's no plan. 
just like there was no plan during the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster in my hometown in 1979. I was there and the local officials told us everything was fine, everything was under control. As the core of the nuclear reactor continued to melt down and radioactive gases were released. The officials did not tell the public that a hydrogen bubble had formed in the damaged reactor, a bubble that could explode. And they didn't tell us because there wasn't any way for 600,000 people to run away. And we were lucky. The bubble did not explode because we wouldn't have survived. I can survive a fire. I, I read about this a couple of years ago. There was a couple about my age and uh, they, they were trapped in their home by a wildfire uh, in North, was Northern California and uh, there had been no alert to, to evacuate. And so they, they jumped in a swimming pool and they put t-shirts over their faces to keep out the smoke. Their house burned to the ground, but they made it. And when it was over, they were able to call their kids. I need to survive for my kid. My kid is 22 and she calls me two or three times a day from New York City to tell me what brand of tomato sauce she put on her chickpea pasta. She'll tell me her piano student loves her lessons. She'll tell me she had a date with someone new. When she calls, I need to be on the other end of the line. She's told me, mom, I lost my dad when I was 14. I can't lose you. One night my phone was off by mistake and my kid almost called the cops because she was afraid that I was lying unconscious on the floor. Beyond my patio door is a swimming pool. I can't swim, but I can crouch. I can crouch in the shallow end and save only myself. The smell of smoke is stronger. I'm sure of it. I can walk to that door. I can put my hand on the latch. Wow. I was with you every minute as I always am, Vicki, with your stories. And by the way, I do know that she has the goldfish and the newts and the cat. <laughs> um, thank you, Vicki. Your stories always really make us think. A sober awakening. And now I'd like to bring up our next storyteller, who I also met at Community Storytellers around 30 years ago. And if not for Audrey Kopp, Community Storytellers would have probably folded. She was the one who kept our group, she and Leonard Ellis, who is in our audience this afternoon, really kept the group going for many, many years. When it became difficult for folks to get to the library in Culver City because of traffic, because of changing family circumstances, like me having children. And it was really Audrey who kept the lifeline to community storytellers attached. So I really am appreciative that she put in all those hours to keep our group going. I asked Audrey to tell us a little bit about herself and she said, having read zillions of folk and fairy tales as a youngster, she is now pleased to be able to tell these stories to people of all ages. And I am grateful to call Audrey my friend. So please help me welcome Audrey Kopp. Thank you, Karen. 
And I would like to thank Karen for putting all this stuff together and for keeping community storytellers telling uh, is still going on as you can see is happening today. I just wonder how many of the people here have ever been up to a town way high up in the mountains in Colorado by the name of Leadville? Well, if you've been there, I'm sure you've been into their uh, general store and you probably have bought a postcard with a picture, a color postcard with a picture of a fur covered trout. Now I wanna tell you about that. You see, many years ago when Leadville was established, it was in 1878, I believe, there were lots of miners who came into town and they were so busy mining that they didn't have time to go out and catch any game for themselves. So they hired a bunch of good game hunters and those guys, they would get deer, they would get wild turkeys, and best of all, they would catch the trout that was in the Arkansas River, which was just right there too. Well, one summer, that summer, there was a great, great amount of rain and there was a great, great amount of forage for the deer. And so the deer grew kind of fat and happy. And when they had deer for dinner, the miners were so happy because it had a nice fatty taste to it. And even beyond that, there was all kinds of stuff going on too with the, um, tallow that collected in the uh, mouths of the miners. It also collected from the fried potatoes that they seem to be having every night. And after a while, the inside of the mouth, the roof of the mouth was just coated with the tallow or the grease from all these uh, potions and potatoes that they were eating. It was okay except that it kind of ruined the taste of anything that they would eat. And the miners didn't like that one bit. But then one of the fellows had an idea and he gathered everybody together and he put them in a big circle. And then to each of them, he gave a little handful of, the, of shavings from a pine tree. And then he asked them to put the shavings right there on their head, which they did. And then he went around and lit all those little piles of shavings. And all that stuff, it burns fast and furiously. It burns so fast and furiously that it didn't do any harm, but it kind of sent heat all the way down their faces. And the towel, it just began to drip out of the mouths. And then the miners could taste again and they were really, really happy. But they got a little unhappy when they realized that all that fierce heat had kind of taken away all the hair on their head. And if you're gonna be in Colorado in the winter time, you need all the hair on your head that you can possibly have. Now, nobody knew what to do about it, but it so happened that down in Kentucky at that particular time, there was a fellow who had, was making uh, a restorative, a hair restorative, and he was really, really, really successful at what he did. He was so successful that he had helped everybody in the territory where he was and nobody had to buy any more of his stuff. But fortunately, he heard about those miners up in Leadville. So he collected all his things, his mill and his special ingredients and went on up to Leadville. And then he set up shop there. And sure enough, the hair restorative worked just as well as it had down in Kentucky. And one day he got an order from some of the mining camp that lived just across the river from where he was. So he gathered up four bottles, which is what they wanted. And he tucked one under one arm, tucked another under another arm, picked up a third one, picked up a fourth one and started across the log that connected his camp to the camp on the other side. He'd done it many times before, but unfortunately that day, a little bit of rain started coming down and it made the log a wee bit slippery. And so he just fell off that log and the bottles went crashing down into the rocks at the bottom of the river and all the stuff that was inside just kind of floated away in the river. A couple of days later, everyone decided that it was time for a fish fry. 
And the game hunters went out to the river, they put in their lures, and they could see, they could see these dark shapes still there in the river, but none of them came up towards the lures. So they got some nets, which they had used before, and they went down to their really good fishing hole that they had used many a time before. And they put the net down into that fishing hole and they tried and they tried and they finally were able to bring up one trout in that net. And then when they took out the trout and looked at it, it was covered with the most beautiful soft fur. They were just astonished and they realized that's why none of the trout had come up before with the lures because they were so busy looking at how beautiful each one was. Well, everybody was trying to figure out what to do about that. And Charlie, one of the miners, he said, I know what to do. And he went to his trunk. You see, he had been a barber before he came up to be a miner. And he got out and he put on his white coat and he took out all his shaving stuff and they had some of, then he had some of the fellows make a pole right there at, on the bank of the river. And they painted it white with kind of red striping on it. You know, a barber pole, I'm sure you've seen those before. And he stood right next to it, Charlie did. And then he yelled out as loud as he could, shaving a haircut right here. And sure enough, that he could see a whole parade of fish coming up. And the first one just sort of came up a little bit out of the river. And he took up that fish and he got out his shaving stuff and he just went back and forth on the fish and pretty soon the fur was gone. Well, all the other fish liked that too. And so they just stood in line until they were taken and all the fur came off them. Oh, there was a good fish fry that night. Now, Charlie, he was feeling a little sad about the trout. And so he went to his uh, little cabinet there and he took out talcum powder. And every time he shaved a fish, he would sprinkle the talcum powder on it so as to make the fish, the skin feel nice and soft. But you know, that talcum powder, it ended up going down into the river where it turned into kind of a, a dandruff. And after a while, there were no more fish with fur on them anymore, which made the miners rather happy. But I'm telling you all of this because if you ever do go to Leadville and you go into that general store and you see one of those color photographs of a fur bearing trout, you'll know that the whole picture is a lie. And that's my story. Thank you, Audrey. I believed every word, every single word. So do I. Being a long haired person myself, I would love to meet those long hair fish. <laughs> so thank you for your tale. And now I'd like to bring up another storyteller from the, um, I'd like to bring up another storyteller from the Motherlode Storytelling Guild. And our next storyteller is also a singer-songwriter. Tim McCaffrey is also an amazing artist, and he was the artist behind the beautiful postcards that announced our celebration event. Tim McCaffrey is a songwriter, a singer, and a storyteller from the Central Sierra near Yosemite National Park. He is very lucky. Yosemite happens to be one of my very favorite places on earth. And he is grateful for living so close to his extended family during these interesting times. He's going to be sharing a story with us this afternoon about his grandpa, Jim. So please help me welcome mm. Tim McCaffrey. Thank you, Karen. Did I ever tell you about the story of my grandpa Jim? My grandpa Jim was, uh, he was a great man. He was a big man. He wasn't a tall man. Um, he was more like Santa Claus without a beard. He was a happy, jolly guy, bald, red-faced. Uh, 
my relationship with my grandpa when I was young was, was, was like uh, what I would think most people are with, when they're children with their grandparents. They're happy to see him. My grandpa would come around on occasion. And uh, when I say on occasion, my grandpa would come to my house on, uh, on, on Easter Sunday and Christmas time and, uh, and maybe once or twice in the summer. Um, I was always jealous of uh, some of my friends. One of my closest friends, Carrie Ito, lived across the street from me. Her grandmother lived with her. She was from Japan and she didn't speak a word of English, but they had a great relationship. She would yell at us in Japanese. And I didn't know what she was saying, but it was actually like awesome that we had this relationship with her. And I, I, was, I always wanted that with my own, with my own grandparents. And uh, when I was 15 years old, my grandpa fell ill and he came to live with us. Well, by the time I was 15, the last thing I really wanted to do was hang out with an 80 year old man. And I'm pretty sure the last thing my 80 year old grandfather wanted to do was hang out with this 15 year old kid. But because my grandpa fell ill, they took away his driver's license. And right when I turned 15, I got my permit. And so we had and created this, uh, this mutual relationship where he could get out of the house and I could drive because he was over 25 and that's all I needed in order to drive around town. So together, we formed this bond. He'd get in the car and in the beginning, we wouldn't go far. We'd kind of just drive around the block. He taught me how to drive a stick as he held on uh, for dear life onto the O heck bar. And, uh, and he patiently taught me how to drive a, a stick shift in, in, in that Ford Escort L. It's white car, <laughs> it was sort of a beater. Um, but that graduated into, we started going around town. We drove all over the Bay Area. And, uh, and, and then that turned into me taking him to lunch and we'd have these daily trips. Um, going to lunch and then eventually we would pick up my friends, which I'm not sure was totally illegal, but my grandpa didn't really know the law of uh, what a 15 year old could do. So I convinced him we could pick up my friends and, and together we'd go over the hill of uh, Highway 17, which in hindsight is insane. And we'd end up going to the beach and we'd hang out daily. And as our relationship got closer and closer and I spent my days with him all day with him, I would ask him advice about girls and I'd ask him about, you know, how I should, you know, about jobs and what a 15 year old could do. And as I was closing, closing in on my 16th birthday and, and what is life about? And, and my grandfather being grandpa Jim, he really wasn't a guy who gave advice. He was a storyteller. And I would ask him, you know, I like this girl, how do I go about it? And he wouldn't answer. You know, being me, I thought my grandpa was hard of hearing, but he wasn't. It just wasn't his style. What he would do is he would tell me about his stories, about his past and his life and the things that he would do and the hard work that he put in and, and, and how he got calloused hands and how, and how he would spend his days working for a, a paving company and going from, you know, from the early days of this paving company all the way to a vice president through hard work. And uh, eventually I got my license and eventually my grandpa moved back to his home. And when he moved back home, I'd go visit him and we'd still have talks and we'd still, we'd still carry on a relationship. I'd play pranks on my grandpa and make, you know, I would, I would make uh, prank phone calls to him and his name is Jim and my name is Tim. So I'd call him up and I'd say, yeah, is Tim there? And say, oh yeah, no, Tim isn't here. I said, no, not Tim, Jim. Go, Jim, this is Jim. <laughs> and uh, I'd say, no, not Jim. I said, Tim. And then eventually he goes, Tim, oh, come on. What are you doing to me? And, and then that's usually how almost every phone call with him started. <laughs> uh, a few years later, he passed away. And um, my parents asked me to speak at, at his funeral. And I had wrote, I wrote down a whole speech that I was going to say about, about my grandfather. And when I, when I got up to, to speak about him, it made the most sense to put that, that piece of paper away. And uh, 
what I spoke about was that summer. And what I spoke about was that relationship that I created with him. And in that moment, I learned that all that advice that I was seeking and the friendship that I wanted with my grandfather was there, but it was through his story. And that's how I learned to be the guy I am today. Um, I wrote a song about it. I wrote a song about my grandfather. Um, it's called Cosmonaut. And, uh, and here it goes. I want to tell you about that man I knew who gave it his best shot. He wasn't different than me and you. He was dealt the cards that he got. He would talk about the man in the moon and a little more often than not. He would sound like Aristotle as he drank from the bottom of the liquor that my daddy bought. You cosmonaut, won't you even try to tell me who, what, where, when, and why? His hands were made of leather, steel, wool, and stone. He came from a different era where heroes were made and not born. Sunshine was a shelter, cause his clothes were tattered and torn. And he would take down the crooks from the history books from the moment this boy was born. Cosmonaut, won't you even dare tell me who, what, why, when, and where? Who, what, why, when, and where? It takes more than live on, you take it just to give it that high ride and sinner. With the tale that I'd hear You can be a quitter Or some counterfeiter, you know You might want to reconsider Before you all disappear now He took his last bow Standing on this stage Sometimes I wonder if he think God made the grave. I think about all those rides and the words that he shared. And I remember the places and the beautiful faces of the friends that we had made. You caused me not. You shared with me your truth about where was I sure miss you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. That was so, so beautiful. Oh, thank you. I just feel like I, I met your grandpa and your song really captured his spirit. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. So we are going to be taking a five minute intermission right now. If you need to get up, stretch, go to the bathroom, feed your dog. Uh, while we're taking the intermission, I thought I would put out a poll. And the poll has to do with Thanksgiving dessert. In my family, there's a big debate over what's better, pumpkin pie, pecan pie, apple pie, or other. So if you would like to participate in our poll, you can solve this question once and for all as to what is truly the best Thanksgiving dessert. So I have put out a poll, poll and if you've never done a Zoom poll before, all you need to do is just push the button and we will get our answer 
after the intermission, we'll meet back here at, it's almost 15 after, so about 20 after. And if you don't have to get up and go in the bathroom and do anything, you can also talk <laughs> or stretch. Oh boy, so far the pumpkin pie is winning. That's what I always say. You can't have Thanksgiving without pumpkin pie. My husband doesn't agree though. He's a pecan pie man himself. <laughs> So if you responded with other, if you could please write in the chat what that other might be. And also, if you'd like to participate in our chat as to what you are thankful for this Thanksgiving, that would also be great. So please feel free to write in the chat things you're thankful for. Oh, I see here in the chat, cheesecake. Ooh, persimmon pie. Ooh, that sounds good. Fresh fruit, no pie. I do like fresh fruit. Oh, and PZ said if she could vote, she would vote for pecan pie. <laughs> I like pecan pie, but it's a little, it's a little over the top. Pumpkin pie a la mode is, is, is my favorite. Oh, I'm reading the chat here. Oh, someone asked how long the concert is going to last. The second half will be shorter than the first half, and I'm thinking another half an hour. We started a little bit late because we had some technical difficulty trying to figure out how to turn off the doorbell. We did figure it out, but we had a little a little Zoom challenge. I have a question. Yes. How many uh, how many uh, people already performed or shared? Six. Okay. So we have four more storytellers. Okay. So I'm sorry that we're running a little over time. We did figure out how to turn off the doorbell. So at least we don't have the annoying ding dong sound. Will the replay be available on Facebook later on? Uh, the replay will be available on Facebook. It's being broadcast live right now on my Facebook page. If you are not my friend on Facebook, you still can see it. I'm Karen Golden. I'm on Facebook and you will see me standing in front of Machu Picchu. That's me. <laughs> so the Machu Picchu lady and um, you can you can view the concert. The The concert is also going to be uh, the, the link will also be on the SAC website, Storytelling Association of California. They're also going to be allowing you to see the concert later of not allowing, but it'll be recorded and broadcast on their website as well. So you definitely can see the concert in case you have to leave early. There'll be lots of ways to see it. Can you put that link of that website in the chat and also your Facebook link yes. in the chat? Sure. Okay, let me do that right now. Okay, so the SAC Let me put that in the chat. It looks like the co-hosts couldn't vote, but I would have voted for pecan pie. Oh, what? oh, co-hosts can't vote? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
Is it pecan or pecan? That's another poll. That depends on where you're from. Yeah. If you're from the south, it's pecan. <laughs> In the north, it's pecan. <laughs> or pecan. I say tomato, you say tomato. <laughs> okay. Tomato pie would be terrible. <laughs> Okay, while we're still waiting for the results of our poll, I would like to acknowledge a few individuals here today. Marion, are you here? Marion is the person who got this whole thing started. Let me see if, I, if she's here. Marion Ferrante? Yeah, Marion Ferrante. She's here with her video off, so maybe she's still in the bathroom. Okay. So Marion Ferrante is the one who connected community storytellers with the Motherload Storytelling Guild. And is BZ Smith here? I think she had to go be with her mom. Okay, so BZ said that she would be joining us today. I think she's here. Maybe she had to zoom out. So we'll see if we can catch these wonderful ladies later. BZ so, is hooked on listening, but she doesn't seem to be online right now. I, I'm on now. I hear I am. Hi, guys. Okay, BZ, I'm going yes. to just, um, I would just like to, hmm. Unfortunately, I can't spotlight you because the, the, just one second here. Let me see if I can spotlight you. The little arrow that says next is right over your picture. So BZ, can you just say hello to everyone from Mother Hello Lord to everyone. I, uh, I can thank COVID, uh, Code Purple, for me being able to be with you. Um, I was supposed to be with my mother-in-law for her 100th birthday, but instead we did a birthday phone call this morning. So that gave me the chance to be here and it's been just a delight to hear all of your stories and I'm very proud of the tellers from our area and it's very exciting to have an opportunity to hear the tellers from LA uh, where I used to live for a good, a good chunk of my life. So I'm very glad to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like looking to look forward to the next four tellers. I'm sorry? I'm looking forward to the next four tellers. Awesome. <laughs> well, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Motherload Storytelling Guild. It was founded in 2010 by Colleen Nunn, who will be telling a story a little bit later today, and BZ Smith. And it serves the Calaveras and Tolumne counties with ongoing support for people interested in the art of storytelling. And Community Storytellers was formed in 1981, that's 39 years ago, by two very special women named Peggy Prentice and my very, very dear friend, Kathleen Zundell. Peggy and Kathleen, who are no longer with us, would have really loved this concert and perhaps are looking down from above and listening to all these stories because it's because of them that our organization Community Storytellers got started because of their incredible vision. So while everyone is coming back from the bathroom, I'm going to play a little welcome back music on an instrument you may not have seen before. This is called a halusi and it comes from China. And during this season, we celebrate a lot with gourds and pumpkins. And this is a gourd instrument that sounds like this. And now I'd like to bring up our next storyteller. Ruby Simpkins is a storyteller who tells stories that heal the mind, body, and spirit. And her goal is to help bring peace to the world. When I asked her what she's grateful for, she said, for her loving and supportive family 
and friends. So please help me welcome Ruby Simpkins in her telling of The People Could Fly. Okay. Where am I? Thank you, Karen. Now, when I was a little girl, I heard this story and I actually forgotten about it until recently. And when I retired last year, actually I'm more of a poet than a storyteller. I found a story and I said, oh, maybe I should try to learn this story. But um, I'd like to share with you an American Black folk tale. The writer Virginia Hamilton tells us that American Black folk tales belong to all of us. They're a part of American tradition and part of the history of this country. They are stories that were created out of sorrow. They were stories from the hearts and minds of Black people who formed them, expanded them, and then passed them on to us. They're full of love and hope. I think they're truly a celebration of the human spirit. I give you the people could fly. They say the people could fly. Say that long ago in Africa, some of the people knew magic and they would walk up on the air like climbing up on a gate. And they flew, flew like blackbirds over the fields, black shiny wings flapping against the blue sky. But then many were captured for slavery. They say the ones that could fly had to shed their wings because they just didn't fit in the racks and holes at the bottom of the slave ship. Those ships were built for carrying and transporting merchandise, goods and spices that were traded for the slaves. They weren't built for the slaves themselves. So they, they packed them in, they packed them in like books on a bookshelf. Too crowded, don't you know? The folks were full of misery with the up and down of the ship. Many died. The sick and dead were simply thrown overboard. People forgot about flying when they could no longer breathe the sweet scent of Africa, their home. But one old man, Cheeky, Toby was his slave name. He never forgot the magic words. Now the slaves worked from sun up to sundown, from can see to can see. And one day a young woman who once had wings, uh, call her Sarah, was picking cotton with her young child strapped on her back. Now the overseer would ride around on horseback and point out the slaves that were slowing down. And the one called driver would crack his whip over the slow ones to make a move faster. The whip was a slice open cut of pain. So they did move faster, had to, don't you know? Now the overseer pointed to Sarah and the driver cracked his whip striking Sarah and the child. Why ain't he working? Asked the overseer. He's sick, said Sarah. If he can't work, we'll get rid of him. He's slowing you down. Driver, take him and throw him in the river. She'll pick faster without him on her back. No, she said, no, please, uh, please. I'll pick faster. I'll pick for the two of us. I'll pick for three. I beg you, don't drown my child. Pity me, Masa. Pity my child. So Sarah picked faster and faster. She picked as much cotton as five slaves. She picked and could, until she could no longer stand. She was too weak. The sun burned her face. Her child was crying. She was, she was sad and she was starving. She just sat down in the row. Get up, you black cow, said the overseer. He pointed his hand and the, the driver's whip snarled around Sarah's legs. Her dress tore into rags. Her legs began to bleed down onto the earth. 
She couldn't, she could not get up. Too tired, don't you know? So driver told Cheeky, the one they called Toby, take them both down to the river and throw them in. And Cheeky helped Sarah up from the row and they walked slowly down towards the river. He helped her remember the magic words. He said, you gotta remember, child. It's there inside you. Go deep, child, go deep. It's still there. The magic is still there. It's still there, still there. And suddenly you heard, come kunkayali, come bubatambe, and other magic words over and over again. And Sarah lifted her leg, one foot onto the air, come kunkayali, come bubatambe, and then the other, come kunkayali, come bubatambe. She held the child slightly in her arms, and then, and then she felt the magic, the African mystery, come kunkayali. They say she rose as free as a bird, as light as a feather. And the overseer, overseer rode after her hollering, come back, come back, you black cow, come back. But she flew higher over the fences and then higher over the woods. Come kunkayali, come bubatambe. Tall trees couldn't snag her. The overseer couldn't catch her. She flew like an eagle now as just until she was gone from sight but no one did speak about it couldn't believe it the master said it was a, a lie a trick of the light the driver well he kept his mouth shut but it was it was because they that was there saw that it was don't you know she flew away to freedom she had lost her wings on the voyage over from Africa, but she still had the magic power of flight deep within. They say the ones who could not fly remained slaves and told their children about the people who could fly. And my great, great grandmother, who was a slave, told my great grandmother, Mary, who was born a slave, and later freed. And she told my grandmother Luella and Mama, who was born free, told me. And I, who was also born free, have told it to you, don't you know? Come kunkayali, come bubatambe. Thank you. Thank wonderful, you. wonderful, yes, very, you. very powerful telling of the people could fly. Thank you. Thank you. So it looks like I'm going to have to relaunch that favorite Thanksgiving dessert poll because I don't know what happened, but somehow pumpkin pie got eliminated from the list. Mm -hmm. So I am going to relaunch the poll as I introduce our next storyteller. Coming to us from the Motherlode Storytelling Guild, Angie, oh, let me move the poll here. Angie Heiss has never been able to answer the question with one word about her bio. She says, that her stories are usually personal and original. And she is very grateful for her family and her continued health in these crazy COVID times. And she added poo, poo, poo to her bio. So please help me welcome Angie as she shares her story, Coming to America, a true story about her mother that takes place during World War II. Hi. Just one second. Okay, you know what? I have the results. First of all, of the Thanksgiving dessert, 67% pumpkin pie, 17% 
pecan or pecan pie, 11% apple pie, and 6% other. So if those of you who voted other, once again, if you could please put in the chat what you mean by other. Please help me welcome Angie. Thank you, Karen. And thank you all for being here today to support storytelling. And to my daughter-in-law in Australia, happy birthday. Now, 2020, COVID, the election. But let's also remember that this year, 2020, is the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, 75 years ago. And because of this, I wanted to share with you a true World War II story. This is my mother's story. She lived it, she told it to me, and now I tell it to you. And it begins in January of 1944 during the war, and it begins with a mosquito. Now, that mosquito, an Anopheles mosquito to be exact, is the reason that my parents ever met. It's the reason that my mother and I emigrated from England to the United States after World War II. But that mosquito did not bite my mother. Mm -mm. In January of 1944, my very British mother, Claire, was sitting in the officer's mess at her Air Force base in Eastbourne, England. She was listening to Vera Lynn on the loudspeaker singing White Cliffs of Dover, and she was sipping a cup of tea and relaxing before her shift in code and cipher. When war had broken out between England and Germany, my mother had listed in the British Women's Auxiliary Air Force, the WAFs. And she chose the WAFs for two reasons. First, she liked to serve her country. And second, she liked the navy blue uniform of the WAFs more than she did of the khaki uniform of the British Women's Army. My mother did take the WAFs very seriously, and she became a commissioned officer, a squadron leader, which is the equivalent here of major. And she made a stunning officer in that navy blue uniform. Now, my father, Joe, was quite the opposite. He wasn't British. He was a Yank. He'd been born and raised in California and lived in California all of his life, except for the war years. And when war broke out after Pearl Harbor with America and the rest of the world, my father enlisted in the American Army Air Corps, and he became a corporal. And the Air Corps sent him to the South Pacific Theater of War, and he probably would have remained there for the duration of the war if it hadn't been for that mosquito. In January of 1944, somewhere off of the Solomon Islands, that mosquito bit my father and it gave him malaria. Now he was so ill and so delirious that the Air Corps decided to fly him back to the military hospital at Hickam Field in Honolulu. And he was not expected to live. He was delirious, he was feverish, but he did live. He made a full recovery and the Air Corps now had to return him to active duty but they couldn't send him back to the South Pacific because he could have a relapse of the malaria. So they sent him to the European theater of war, to England to be exact. And in June of 1944, when my mother Claire and my father Joe were both in London on leave, they were introduced through a mutual friend. Now my mother was then 26 years old and my father was 29 years old neither had been married before, and they fell for each other very fast and very seriously. So seriously that two months later, in August of 1944, even though my mother outranked my father, they were married. And 10 months later, I was born. And they were to be happily married for 45 years until my father's death. Now, after the war ended in Europe in May of 1945, my father was demobilized, sent back to California, 
was the end of his service. But my mother and I couldn't follow right away because we were being processed by the US government for emigration, all the GI brides were. So my mother finally received word that we were going to be sailing in February of 1946 on the Queen Mary, on the Queen Mary's first boatload of GI brides after World War II. But the brides didn't just get on the Queen Mary. Mm -mm. They had to spend a week at an army transit camp for final processing in Tidworth, which was on the Salisbury Plain, not too far from Southampton and the docks. And my mom had one word for Tidworth, horrible. It was mud, it was unheated barracks, no cribs, no bassinets. They weren't really ready for these GI brides yet. And to make matters worse, there was a terrible attitude at Tidworth. The soldiers who had to stay behind to staff it wanted to be home. And they were also using Italian and German prisoners of war, POWs, to do the menial work. These men wanted to be home too, because the war had now been over for nine months and they were still serving. One afternoon, my mother was ready to scoop me up and take me to lunch in the mess hall, but I'd fallen fast asleep on my cot and there was nobody else in the barracks. Everybody else had gone to lunch. So my mother thought she would just prop some pillows around me so that I couldn't roll off. And she'd run to the mess hall and she'd bring back a sandwich and a jar of baby food. That wouldn't take long. So she did that. And when she got back to the barracks and she opened the door, she froze in horror. I was fine. I was still asleep on the cot with the pillows. Nobody else was in the barracks. They were still at lunch, except for a young, blonde, German prisoner of war who was standing right over me, looking down at me with his fists clenched. My mother dropped the jar of baby food and the sandwich, and he looked up and clenched his fists even more tightly. And my mother could see that he had leaned his janitor's broom against a pole. So my mother raced down the aisle between the rows of cots and she grabbed that pole with both hands and she looked at him and she said, what do you think you're doing? And he looked at her and he looked at the broom and he looked at me and he realized what she was thinking. And he said, ah, oh, nine, nine. And then very, very slowly, he took his left hand and reached inside his POW jacket pocket to an inside pocket and pulled out a wrinkled black and white photograph and held it up to my mother. It was the photograph of a little blonde baby who looked just like me at that point in time. And he said to my mother, hey, babe, Mine, baby, mine. And then he carefully put that picture back. My mother said, ah, and she leaned that pole back against the pole. And then my mother stared at him because this had been the enemy for almost six years. This man to my mother represented death and carnage and fear. My mother, several years earlier, had lost an Australian fiancé who was a bombardier. He was shot down over Berlin in his Lancaster bomber. My mother watched all those young pilots at the different air bases she was assigned to leave on missions and never come back. And then my mother, when London was having the 80 plus nights of bombing night after night, wondered if her parents had survived because they refused to leave their home in London. And she'd get word from them. And she'd learn about friends and neighbors who'd lost their homes or their lives or both. So as my mother stared at this young man, she had no love for Germans at this time in her life. But she looked and she tried to hate. She truly tried to hate this man. But all she could see was a young man far from home 
missing his family, missing his baby. So she took a step over to the cot. I was still asleep and slowly, slowly, she put her hands underneath my sleeping blanketed body and she placed me in his arms. Well, he stood there and the tears streamed down his cheeks onto my blanket and my mother cried too. A few days later, the buses came to transport the brides and their children to the docks at Southampton to board the Queen Mary. And five days later, my mother and I arrived in America. But my mother arrived changed forever. Because of that experience back at that horrible camp in Tidworth, my mother could never hate groups of people again. Because my mother in Tidworth had looked into the face of her enemy and she had seen humanity. Thank you. Wow, Angela, what a, what a beautiful and very poignant story to be telling, especially during this time of year when we're thinking about the things that we're grateful for. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And now I would like to bring up our next storyteller. I have known Elena Beth Kay, I think at least 28 years, maybe longer. And when I asked her how she started in on storytelling, she said she made up a scary story for her Girl Scout campmates and she got hooked. And now she has been telling both folk tales and personal stories for decades. She is thankful that like a lotus growing out of the mud, this pandemic has allowed her to meet and tell with other storytellers from all around the world. Please help me welcome Elena Beth Kay. And now I'm trying to find you. <laughs> I should be there at the top. Hmm. Co-hosts. You are not for some reason. Really strange, but I found you. Oh, good. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm still so moved from that story that Angie told. I need to take a breath, so maybe everyone take it with me. And, uh, and Vicki, my story is a, a bookend with yours. Okay. Once in a land far away, in a time long ago, there was a merchant, a rich merchant, a wealthy merchant, and yet a respected and liked merchant. People from towns far away had heard of this man. And one who heard was a young man who was just starting to be a merchant and wanted to find out what is the secret of this wealthy merchant? So he traveled to the town where the wealthy merchant lived. He found him, he came up to him, he asked, may I learn your secret? I would be happy to follow me for a day, see what I do, and then at night I will tell you my secret. The young man was so excited and he followed him the next day as he went from place to place in the marketplace where somehow with his bargaining, every person that he dealt with felt that they got a good deal. Have you ever bargained? I mean, really bargained? We don't do that that much here. But there's a lot of negotiation back and forth. And there are little things like 
Sometimes the merchant would have his eye on one thing, but look at everything else and then say, oh, and uh, what about that one? Sometimes if the amount wasn't to his liking, he would say thank you and leave. And then the, the shopkeeper inside would know, oh, wait, he's serious, and would run after him and say, oh, <laughs> I was just kidding. Come back, come back. I can sell this to you. And each person felt that they had a good deal. One of the places that they went to, it looked as if the sun purposefully had a beam of light that went down to the window and went right onto an item that made the young man's heart stop. He couldn't tell from afar if it was a, a vase or an oil lamp. As they came closer, he could see the gold and, and even carvings and etchings upon it jewels of, of many different colors that seemed to be on fire from that sunlight. It was beautiful. He didn't know if it had come from a, an Egyptian tomb or from Aladdin's cave. Could it be something that if you rubbed it, a genie would come out? All he knew was that this was exquisite. And he watched as the merchant did all the little tricks that he'd been seeing him do. But he and the shop owner weren't able to come to an agreement. And so they left. As they took each step away, the young man kept looking, waiting to see, isn't the shop owner going to, to come running after us to say, oh, it's all right wasn't there yet, he said to the wealthy merchant, the, 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 the shop owner isn't coming. The merchant said, it's all right. I don't have to buy everything. But, 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 and as they went further away, he started to feel sweat going down his forehead and finally he couldn't stand it. If the wealthy merchant wasn't gonna buy this, then he would, and he ran back. When he joined the merchant again, he was holding this as if it were a baby in his arms, so happy. That night, he was ushered into the wealthy merchant's home, was told, sit on a cushion. Tea was brought to him, and he was ready to hear the secret. The merchant said, Every night, when I go to bed, I close my eyes and I see the beautiful carved bed that I'm in, in my mind. I walk out of the bed in my mind and I see the woven tapestries, the woolen carpets, the, the statuettes made of gold everything that is beautiful in my home. I appreciate each thing. I caress it. I love it. Yes. Yes, said the young man. And then, in my mind, I reach for a torch. I put it to the fireplace. I go to look closely at the beautiful drapes, and then I put the torch to them. And I watch as everything burns. Soon I'm surrounded by nothing but ashes. And, 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 and the secret? I see the smiles of my family and I look down, <laughs> I see me, I'm here and I'm fine. But the, the secret, 
every night in my mind, I burn it all. The young man thought, well, he could have just told me that he didn't want to let me know the secret. And the next day he thanked him and he went back home. And he was a successful merchant. He treated people well, but he never quite felt that he was successful enough. And the wealthy man kept getting wealthier, made much and gave as much away lived a long, healthy, and happy life. And every night in his mind, he burned it all. Thank you, Elena Beth. That was an absolutely beautiful story and told with so much heart and soul. Thank you. So a number of you have been typing in the chat that you're trying to see the concert on Facebook. I'm not understanding why some of you are struggling, I, unless I'm doing something wrong, but I'm looking at Facebook right now and I'm seeing the concert on my Facebook page. So if there's anyone who is really knowledgeable, Elena Beth, maybe you, about Facebook, why is it that some of you are not able to see the concert? Well, I don't see it either. I'll may, maybe afterwards we can, um screen share because I'm sure you can put it on afterwards. I don't know why it's not showing live if there was a set. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure, but I'm I'm actually seeing it live when I when I hold up. Camden refreshed their page. Okay, my husband says refresh your page. Maybe that's it. Because look, it's here on my Facebook right here. I'm seeing that's me talking it's right so now. Funny. You see? So I don't know why I don't know why it's not coming out. Uh so if anyone has any ideas about that, you can let me know, but it's it's difficult for me to be doing both at the same time. So I am going to put a link in the chat if I can get my, okay, I'll, I'll put it in there in a minute. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be putting a link in the chat to food historians and pies in case you're curious as to why the various pie choices have become what they are for Thanksgiving. And it is now time for me to introduce our final storyteller this afternoon. Colleen Nunn is the co-founder of the Mother Lode Storytelling Guild in Calaveras and Tolumne counties, and she is the creator of Murphy's Story Slam. She wants to wish her brother and sister-in-law a very happy anniversary because she told this story at their wedding five years ago. And when I asked her what she's grateful for this Thanksgiving, she said she is forever grateful for her family. So please help me welcome Colleen. I just have to find her here. Thanks. Colleen, speak out because you're not the first top row here. Oh, I'm not in the first top row, my goodness. Thank you, Karen, so much for organizing this for us. Oh, my pleasure. I am just honored to be a part of this group of amazing storytellers. I'm gonna take off my glasses so you don't see my screen reflected. Um, another amazing storyteller, Claire Murphy, gave me this story. She gave me permission to take it and make it my own and tell it at my brother's wedding a long time ago. In the days of lumber camps and logging towns in the Sierra Nevada foothills of California, there lived a young man. He lived with his mother 
and every day he went to work in the lumber cut. One day this young man decided that it was time for him to go out into the world and find himself a wife. He told his mother this and she said, son, I know that you will go and find yourself the perfect woman to be your wife. But son, promise me this one thing. Promise me that before you ask her to be yours, bring her home so that I can meet her. And the young man said, of course, mother, I promise I will bring her home to meet you before I ask her to be my wife. The next day, the young man was working in the lumber cut and he looked up and across the cut, he saw Ingrid Svensson. Now, Ingrid Svensson was the daughter of the lumber foreman and she was bringing her father lunch for the midday meal. And the young man couldn't believe that he had never noticed that Ingrid Svensson was the most beautiful woman in the world. His heart was beating and before he knew it, he found himself walking across the cut right up to Ingrid Svensson and he asked her if he could come calling on her the next day. So the next day, Ingrid said yes, because she looked him up and down and he was a lumberjack. So the next day, the young man was sitting with Ingrid in her mother's front parlor, very proper. Ingrid didn't say very much, but that was okay because the young man was perfectly content to sit and admire Ingrid's, Ingrid's flaxen hair and her bright blue eyes. She was 100%, no doubt about it, the woman that he wanted to make his wife. And so before long, he asked her to come home and meet his mother. The three of them sat together on his mother's front patio and she asked Ingrid about her family, how, his fa her, how her father was doing at the lumber cut in his new position as foreman. And before too long, he heard his mother say, son, Son, you see that boulder over in our garden, way over in the corner? Would you do me a quick favor? Would you please go and get that boulder for me? And you can bring it right over here. Just send it right there. Now, this was a very strange request. In all of this young man's life, that boulder had sat right there in that garden, never moved. But Ingrid was watching. And so he flexed his muscles, he squared his shoulders, and he walked right up to that boulder. He planted his hands underneath the boulder as far as he could get his fingers under. And with all of his might, he pulled. Oh, he couldn't budge the boulder. And from behind him, he heard his mother say, Ingrid. Would you look at that? My son can't even move a rock. How can you trust him to provide for your future? And he heard Ingrid behind him say, I guess I can't. And he saw the most beautiful woman in the world walk down the lane away from him. He was heartbroken. And his own mother was the reason why. He, he couldn't believe that his chances of marriage would disappear just like smoke. But he was a practical boy. He was resilient. He, he thought, well, if I can't marry the most beautiful woman in the world, at least I can still get married, have a family. And, and he thought, you know what? Mary McCoy. Mary McCoy is looking for a husband. And, and Mary McCoy was looking for a husband because her father, unfortunately, died in the lumber cut the year before. And everybody knew that she was needing some help taking care of her family and protecting them. So the next time the young man saw Mary McCoy, he walked right up to her and he said, Mary, I want to take you home to meet my mom. And it was a little sudden. Mary was taken by surprise, but it was true that she was looking for a husband. And she knew what it meant to go home and meet your mom. So she said, yes, I already know your mom. We sing together in the choir, but I'd like to go home with you and meet your mother. So there they were all sitting on the front porch. Mary and the young man's mother were talking about the choir, the church, 
They were wondering if the preacher last Sunday might have gotten a little bit too excited while he was delivering the sermon. But before too long, you know what happened. His mother said, son, would you go fetch me that boulder over there in the garden? Now, the young man, he was prepared. He'd been practicing. He'd been lifting small rocks. And he built his way up to some of the bigger ones. But, but he'd never actually gotten up to the size of the boulder in the garden, but he was gonna give it his best shot. He walks up, digs his fingers under, and with all of his might, he... Oh, but he couldn't budge the boulder. And from behind him, his mother says, Mary, how can you expect a man who can't even move a rock to protect your family? And she said, I can't. And off she walked, Mary McCoy, down the road, well, the young man was, he gave up. It's never going to happen. My own mother has it out against me. I'm never going to marry. I'll never have a family. He moped around for days until his friends came and they knocked on his door and they said, come, come on, come with us. Come down to the market. Maybe you'll meet someone. Maybe you won't. Doesn't even matter. Come have a drink. We'll sit. We'll have a good time. So the young man agrees, yeah, okay, fine. I'll go to the market. I won't meet anyone, but I'll sit and have a drink. So there he is at the market. He's having a drink. And he hears this sound. And it's, it's, a, it's a woman laughing. But it's like no laugh that he's ever heard before. It's like joy and, and bells tinkling. And he looks around and, and there's this group of young women over across the market. And the, the group parts a little bit and he sees this woman. He's never met her before, but she's got brown curly hair. She's got brown eyes, kind of plain. But one of the other girls in her group says something and she laughs. And it's just the best sound that he's ever heard. Before he knows that his feet are marching him across the market, he walks right up to her and he asks her, what's your name? Her name is Jane. She's the new school mistress. And he asks her if, Jane, can I come calling on you tomorrow? Now, Jane explains that because she's the new school mistress, the rules are that she only gets one half day a week for court. And because of this, the young man and Jane, they get to know each other slow. One half day a week for a long time. He calls on her and they go walking and Jane, She's smart. She, she's got opinions and she's got ideas. And the young man just loves listening to her talk. But more than that, he loves listening to her laugh. And so he does, he does things to try to make that happen just as often as he can. And he's pretty sure at this point, 100% positive. Jane is the woman for him. Jane is the woman he wants to spend the rest of his life. And so he knows that what he has to do eventually is meet with his mother and Jane on their front porch. So they, they, go, they go to meet with his mother and his mother and Jane, they're getting along like a house on fire. They both love poetry, they're talking. And then inevitably his mother says, son, would you go and get that boulder from me, for me? And his, his heart's in his toes. He knows exactly what's coming, but he's, he's gonna do his very best. He walks over to that boulder. He's thinking about Jane and the rest of their life and the family they're gonna make. And he digs his fingers under that boulder as hard as he can. And with every muscle fiber in his calves, in his thighs, in his back, in his toes, he but he can't move the boulder. And all of a sudden a shadow comes across that rock and he sees two small hands join his on either side of the rock. And he looks up and he, he sees Jane's two brown eyes looking back at him. And together they move the boulder. And behind him, he hears his mother say, son, that's the woman 
you'll want to marry. Thank you. Thank you so much for that amazing story. You know, when you're talking about really big boulders, in my mind, I'm thinking of that uh, elevated mass at the LA County Museum of Art, <laughs> the really giant big boulder. So, uh-oh, somebody is sharing their screen. I think that might've been a mistake. Guess what? We did it. So I, Marion is back in, in view. Can you please unmute yourself? Let me see if I can find you here. Marion, where are you? Here you are. Um, I'm going to spot, oh, I was just gonna spotlight you for just a second. I just wanna thank you so much for making a match between the Motherload Storytelling Guild and community storytellers. I'm going to also um, spotlight, if I can find everybody, all of our storytellers, so we can give a final round of applause. This is the point where we're supposed to hear thunderous applause. So you can unmute yourselves if you like. Very good. Uh, Who's missing? Thank you. Oh, wait That's just a second. Right. Hmm. Why can't I? I guess you can't add a spotlight to everyone. So I'm going to unspotlight Marion. Thank you. And I'm going to spotlight Audrey, and I'm going to unspotlight myself because I want to make sure, and I'm going to spotlight Peter. There we go. So let's hear it for all of our amazing storytellers. Am I, am I missing anyone? Nick. Nick, where are you? Nick. I'm still here, but I'm not spotlighted. Okay. Okay, I'm going to have to unspotlight someone. I guess you can only spotlight nine people at a time. So let's hear it for the first nine. Thank Ooh. you. Yay. And I'm going to unspotlight. Ooh. Okay, let's see here. This this technology here. Let me, Nick. Let me find Nick here. Nick, where are you? There we go. Let's add Nick to the mix. There we go. Yay! Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm going to this is really special. With one more gourd instrument. So I'm going to end with a thunderstorm in lieu of applause. So this is for all of our storytellers. <laughs> it's just another gourd instrument for the holidays. <laughs> Well done. well done. And I want to thank okay. all of our amazing listeners. Many of you have written feverishly in the chat. How can we see this again? How can we see the concert? It will be posted on the SAC website. So not to worry. And it is on my Facebook page. I've looked. It's there. So I don't know why you can't see it right now. Maybe it's because all of you are here and the universe doesn't want you to be in two places at once. Maybe that's it. So I'm going to unspotlight all of our tellers. And now if you would like to mingle and chat with each other as best as we can on Zoom, I want to thank all of our incredible listeners for coming today and for bearing with us as we navigate the technology. <laughs> let, let me just remove all the final okay here's the final spotlight I'm just going to spotlight myself okay so this is a thank you to all of you wonderful listeners thank you for staying overtime today we appreciate it is there anything anyone else would like to say an announcement or something thanks to Karen for emceeing thank you, yeah. my pleasure <laughs> I'd like to know if this happens every week or every month or when the next one is. New year.
So I am going to, um, I forgot Sorry. to add this announcement. And that is if you would like to come and join us at our community storytellers meetings, I'm going to spotlight myself again. If you could please put your name and your email in the chat and we will make sure that you are invited to our next meeting. We generally meet now on Zoom, the fourth Sunday of every month at three o'clock, we are on Zoom. So and the email and, could go privately to Karen instead I'm, of everybody. I'm sorry? The email address doesn't have to go to everyone. It could go privately to Karen. Yes, it can go privately to me. Thank you. So, it, so please send your email to me privately. I'll make sure you get on our mailing list. We have a meetup group. So if you're on meetup, you can find us at Community Storytellers. And if you'd like to join the Motherload Storytelling Guild, could someone from Motherload please speak up and say how they can get in touch with you? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, just uh, give Colleen a little rest. Um, we have a Facebook page that is the Motherload Storytelling Guild. So that's a place to reach out to us and uh, send us a, a message there. Also, our email address for the guild is pretty easy to remember. It's Motherload Storytellers at gmail.com and um in a few -E. ode ode don't load up the truck go find that vein of gold it's that load of the load of of gold so um no but don't dig it up please because it'll destroy the earth the california gold rush the worst and i'm sure peter will agree with me the worst I'm environmental event of this continent ever so, uh, but you know, we, we have fun with it. We tell stories about it, we, but nonetheless, it is the mother load, L-O-D-E, storytellers uh, at gmail.com. And we're a very small group who work really hard together and we have a wonderful outreach within our community. Um, I just thought you might like to know that all of you guys made the front page of the newspaper uh, this last, about two weeks ago. And then this week, this event, you guys, was uh, one of the lead stories in our arts and culture supplement to our local newspaper. So we were really jazzed uh, to have so many people in our community excited about meeting all of the LA tellers and uh, very excited to have an opportunity to have you get to know some of our finest storytellers here in the uh, Motherlode area. Uh, and yes, we do live very close to Yosemite National Park. It's night. The valley floor is 90 minutes from my front door. And Angie, how close do you live to the valley floor? 45 minutes. Five minutes. And that 45 drive is- 45 minutes from my house to the gates. 